fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery. Well, welcome back into the house of mystery. I'm Al Warren. We've got Mr. Michael Hawley here, so you know it's going to that be is correct. dark. Dark, mysterious day. Oh, absolutely. And actually, in a little bit here, Halloween will be coming up with my decorations. I go a little crazy. (laughs) Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. You know, I always get inundated with, like, pumpkin spice stuff, and then all of a sudden you're doing this daily ritual of putting up bones and stuff all over your property. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. How long does it take you to clean that up? Uh, actually, not. I go pretty fast cleaning it up, you know, because I just throw them in, cram it into the, uh, you know, the shed, and then. But when I take it out, it's like, oops! I should have been a little more careful putting that away. <laughs> so it takes about a month and a half to put it all together. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's crazy. Uh, it's crazy, but somebody's got to do it, you know. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. That's that. why it'll be fun interviewing today. Yeah, because we are interviewing Halloween herself. <laughs> That's right. No, not exactly. But uh, we're talking about a new book, and it's called The Madness, a novel. Uh, Dawn Kurtigic, thank you for being here. Uh, Thank you for having me, and hello, children out there listening to this dark episode. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, We don't allow children on this show. (laughs) What a (laughs) shame. They're the scariest thing in the world. (laughs) Yeah, it gets gets kind of dark and abusive sometimes, you know, especially with Michael. (laughs) He's, he gets really into it, you know. It's terrible. It's a bit. Yeah. I thought you, you know. were the one who needed the trigger warning, Alan. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. See, she's got your number. <laughs> <laughs> I always turn the turn the you know have them directed at Michael, and then I get them from behind when it's too late. <laughs> Quit picking on Michael. That's what they all say. Yeah. So listen, uh, the madness. So what led you to to writing? Well, you know, this book. Like, how did you get into it? And and this type of book as well. Like, I, um, is this something you've always been into? Always, yeah. Um, I blame my mother. She showed me it okay. when I was about five and Prince of Darkness around the same age. And I was always so fascinated and scared by these things, especially supernatural, paranormal things. But I just can't get enough, so I think I'm just a masochist. But yeah, this book was actually interesting. It didn't happen the way most books do because I was asked to write a retelling of a classic novel. I don't know if I'm allowed to say which classic novel. People have been saying to go in blind, so I shan't mention it. But um, yeah, it was an interesting challenge. And I was approached by Alloy, and they are the book side of Warner Brothers to do this retelling. And I thought, oh, okay, this is going to be cool. I had read the original novel. <laughs> Again, I won't say which one it is because people are saying not to say and to just go in blind. And I was, um, I love the tone of it. I love the atmosphere. I love the gothicness of it. But I was kind of left a little bit dissatisfied by how the women were portrayed. And this is exactly what Alloy wanted to explore. So we decided to dive ahead and try and make something new and exciting. And then, of course, we spent two years trying to figure out why now, the why behind the book. And sort of the universe stepped in and said, I shall tell you why. Here is Epstein. Here is Weinstein. Here is me too. (laughs) It was all these glaring uh, messages that just fit so perfectly with, with a message that we wanted to say. And the story came from there. I had to make it my own, though, after that. So I set it in Wales, which is where I live. And that's kind of how it came to be. It sounds like it's very meaningful, like you have a real, I don't know, let's say a subtext behind the story, something that you want a reader to take away from, you know, the actual story and not inter- just entertainment. My main focus is always entertainment and to scare people. This is the first time I've written something with a message in it. Um, and it's funny because I normally stray away from stories like that, but i would had personal experience with this kind of thing before, mostly in a medical context. For those of you listening um, who don't know who I am, I had a liver transplant when I was 25. And um, in the medical setting, unfortunately, I had met several doctors, including my primary doctor, who wouldn't listen to me because of my gender. And I remember I was very, very sick. I was about 
24, I went to the doctor and I, you know, I said, look, I've got these very worrying symptoms, these symptoms of liver failure, because I knew what they were. We knew, we knew I was sick. And he said to me, well, you're overweight, so just keep losing weight and go home and uh, don't be so anxious. <laughs> and he essentially wow. sent me home to die. And honestly, it's only because I had the phone number of a different doctor from a different uh, county who had become a friend. And because I texted this doctor who said, come into the hospital right now, uh, that I'm here because I was listed for transplant the next week. Wow. I felt there was something here that I had, I had skin in the game in this context. So yeah, normally I'm, I'm, all, I'm all about the scares and the entertainment and not so much about the heavy messaging, but in this case, uh, it spoke to me. How about your primary? Did, uh, what, did you speak to your primary afterwards to find out uh, they feel like stupid? <laughs> You know, I didn't because I ended up staying down in London in this hospital uh, because to be listed for transplant, you have to have loads of tests run on you. They have to take arterial blood and they have to do lung tests and they have to essentially make sure that you're sick enough and fit enough for the for the for the um, the operation. By the time I got back, uh, my husband did actually submit a letter to, I think, the, I don't know what it's called in the UK, like the medical board or something. And they replied basically saying, oh, I'm sure you didn't mean you know, badly. And, and I understand why, because the NHS is so short for doctors, they couldn't exactly do anything. You know, they, there's no like disciplinary action because, you know, there's nothing they can do except to say, well, we'll do better next time. And, um, but he retired six months later and he was quite, he was too young to retire. So I think maybe something happened behind the scenes. Oh. That I was under, but I wasn't part of all of this because I was so sick at that point. I, I went downhill very quickly. So I guess the universe kind of worked its magic because <laughs> I wouldn't want him to say that to anyone else. It was horrifying. Yeah, who knows? Maybe he did. That's, and you were the straw that broke the camel's back or something. Could be. Could be. So, yeah. He's, he's off playing golf somewhere, I'm sure, <laughs> now. He's probably, yeah, he's probably running for president. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> did you yeah. off him in one of your books then? You know, I, 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 for legal reasons, I shan't be answering that question. <laughs> However, read my next book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you, you, and it doesn't have to be a quick one. It can be real long. You can have like ten chapters where he's tied up somewhere, <laughs> and slowly being drained of blood, you know, and Could kept be. alive. Yeah, maybe I'll give somebody a pet worm or something and give him the doctor's name. Only he will know. <laughs> <laughs> so, how do you transfer some of? your own real experiences into an actual story that is different, you know, because you're using characters that are not real. How do you transpose that? For me, it's an emotion thing. So, you know, when we first started working together, Alloy and I, the book was very different initially. Um, it was a character that I, you know, the, the ideas were very similar, but it was a character that I couldn't really relate to. Uh, initially, she was a investigative journalist and you know she was a ball busting kind of executive type i'm not that way at all i'm very neurotic i'm very um anxious as a person in general and there was a point where i was like i, I can't do this i can't deliver on this this brief and my husband said to me you know what you just again because he said this to me in the past he said you know you just have to dare to be yourself what would you do if no one else was involved because, you know, writing is very solitary and suddenly you're in this collaborative writer's room plotting this amazing thing. He said, what would you do if it was just you? And I said, well, for one thing, she would be different. It would be in Wales. And I started, I got very passionate. I started talking about essentially what the madness became. And he said, just do that. You know, who cares what they say? You're at the end of your rope anyway. So I did. I, I wrote the first third of the book as I saw it, I wrote a very apologetic email, like, please don't be angry, but <laughs> here is this neurotic woman who has compulsive OCD that her trauma has triggered, and, you know, I, I believe in it for this X, Y, Z reason, and they came back and they said, we love this, let's explore it, let's get on a call. And so, yeah, it's just, it, it's emotion-led for me. I see the world as an emotionscape. I'm very, I don't like to use my logic centers very much if I can help it. Uh, but if I can feel a way into a story, then it works for me. It makes sense. That's how I did it with Mina. She just was somebody I understood. And she needed skin in the game as well. Sorry, that's the other thing. Like, the original character had no skin in the game. So she had nothing to lose. And so I needed to 
change that. So Dr. Mina Murray is you were talking about? Yes, that's right. And that's not the same protagonist as the earlier book? or is? She was Mina Murray, but she was a different character altogether. She was very, oh, she, okay. you know, she was more like the character Helen Singer, who's in the novel. Um, and it was more a case of, you know, collaborate. It was more procedural. It was collaborating with police. It was an investigation. Uh, whereas I needed something that this character would fight for because the stakes were so high that she couldn't possibly fail rather than just a woman doing a job. Right. How do you, how do you experience uh, Mina yourself? Like, or do you, how do you describe the relationship? Are you like uh, friends or do you hear her? Do you see her, feel her? Like where, where does this come from? That's a really interesting question. You know, usually when I write, the character comes to me first. And I've done things where I've kept journals as characters to get inside their heads. In fact, for like three of my other books, that was the case. With Mina, I think she existed as a version of myself, uh, a version of myself that is tightly controlled. So I have OCD and um, I experience life in a series of rituals and things I do to keep myself mentally safe. So Mina represents that part of me. She's more consistent and controlled than I am, though. I'm, I'm a little bit scatterbrained and type B compared to her. But I think she just, it's almost like she exists outside of me as a tiny piece of myself. Almost the, the self of, that I would have been, perhaps, if I had gone into psychology and if I hadn't used writing to explore and treat my own traumas. I might have been a Mina Murray. I thought you wanted to be an astronomer. I know I did. And that was, um, again, the romance of it was very different to the practical side of it. So I did a placement at Cavendish Laboratory when I was about 15, 15, 16. And I enjoyed it. But what I didn't realize <laughs> was how slow it was and how <laughs> long you spend waiting which is so funny because publishing is like that anyway. But I remember we went into these Hobbit Hills where these telescopes were hooked up to. And I met these PhD students in their 30s and they were discussing their work. And they're like, yeah, we're waiting for this one specific celestial event to happen. And it happened when I was there. Everything started beeping, all these machines and these paper, these old school, do you remember those old school reams of printer paper that had the green and white lines? They started like exploding out like dot matrix printers and it was this amazing moment, and I was like, oh, my God, I was here to see it. So I said to the guy, what now? And he said, now we spend the next 30 years analyzing it. And at <laughs> that moment, I was like, this is not for me. <laughs> I can't do that. <laughs> I admire it, but I just kind it was the I was caught in the romance of it. So, yeah. <laughs> how, how do you approach dialogue? How do you make the dialogue so that it's realistic? That's like most things I do is very instinctive. I think the dialogue comes to me fairly easily. I um I I'm still learning how to do men justice. Raised by a single mother, um, I don't have loads of experience of familial men. So I study men in films and books and my husband's family and friends that I have. Um, so that is more self conscious for me, trying to get into a male uh, sense of mindset and space and their loquacity or lack thereof whereas with the female characters it all feels like i'm reaching for something that's already there it's almost like i'm dictating rather than writing from the ether <laughs> it sort of comes so do you have your uh, husband as a beta reader in those cases yeah so he does beta read for me not always but um especially with the men he might say to me like a man wouldn't say that a man for example, there was a scene in a previous book where um, a man was worried about a woman being cold, and he was saying to me, like, a guy wouldn't do that. He'd be like, oh, her nipples are showing. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I had to... I get to... in trouble all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, some women are like that, too. Maybe I might be. But, um, yeah, I think the, the other thing is that I tend to be too earnest, so I need to bring levity into my dialogue a lot of the time self-consciously. So everything happens instinctively and things like humor and not taking myself so seriously. Those things come in edits self-consciously because I tend to be too heartfelt and too earnest or too morbid. That's the other thing 
you know, the number of times I'm told, Dawn, no, you can't be that dark. You can't be that morbid. No, you can't chop his head off with a bread knife. It just won't work. <laughs> so all of those kind of things are edits for me. But in terms of dialogue and the flow of things, it's very, very instinctive. Wow. Do you put some humor into it as well? Yes, I try to. I remember getting feedback on my debut novel, The Dead House. <laughs> Somebody said it was too depressing to enjoy. And I thought, I reread it after this. And I don't read reviews, but I did back then as a, as a green writer. And I thought, wow, it, it is quite dark. There's no moment where you can sort of laugh and breathe. And then I started analyzing the media I was consuming, the horror films, the audiobooks, the novels, and paying attention to emotional pacing where a character can have a breath and have some levity and it's not all just dark, dark, dark <laughs> one after the other. Uh, so yeah, I have to self-consciously go and add that in uh, because I, you know, sometimes I forget that people need a break. <laughs> right. And you kind of got, you got to have the right timing for it too, right? The humor. Yeah. It's got to be the right type of humor. You can't. Yeah. And my humor is too dark. <laughs> it's <Yeah>. more <laughs> Dark book, dark humor, that might match. <laughs> yeah. Well, what's what's your inspiration, and I don't mean um, other writers and stuff, but to, to write suspense and horror and uh, be dark like that, What what's the inspiration? Like, um, is there something that you feed off of, um, or is it just your own experiences? I think it's a bit of both. I, I'm really interested in psychology, and I'm interested in the psychology of fear, I think it started for me when I read um, House of Leaves, and I was so curious about why this book, why this text on this paper had such a profound effect on me, why it got into my head and why it didn't go away. And um, I started studying ergodic fiction and studying the psychology of how a reader absorbs a story and then how could I, how could I convey that how could I create a story where a reader takes that experience? But also for me, horror is a safe space. I've heard other people say that there are some people who've had trauma in their lives that do find horror safe because it's a way to process things in a non-dangerous way. I think that's partly true for myself, maybe as a kind of therapy, but also just a kind of curiosity. I like extreme things. Um, and usually horror has this extreme sort of emotional place it's usually life or death or the fate of your soul they are extreme situations that you don't always get in contemporary fiction so maybe i'm just drawn to that more extreme side of the emotional scale but i do i enjoy being afraid even though things like for example i'm terrified of the dark but I forced myself to go and sit in the dark when I was writing one of my novels because a lot of it takes place in the dark. And I tried to think about, okay, well, why am I afraid? Why am I, what, when, what are the sensations? What am I feeling? And then how do I convey that to the reader? That is fascinating to me. It's like mind reading that I can take something and give it to somebody else. I love the dark. I can see <laughs> really? the dark. See, I my husband's like that. <laughs> I can't. I'm so yeah. afraid. <laughs> No, I, I don't need a light. Oh, God, yeah, oh, don't turn on a light. Yeah, I'm no. a vampire. I have to keep the sun out. <laughs> it's so funny, though. I have a vampire schedule, but I always have a candle burning or something. I like low light. And it's so funny because what is there to be afraid of? Like, literally, what is there to be afraid of? And yet the fear persists. Fascinating to me. It's suspense. It's, it's what you can't see. It's the unknown as well. Like, I don't know what I believe in. I like exploring different things, but say you do believe in the afterlife. Okay, could some ghost be watching me right now? That is terrifying. Why do I think about that? And why am I thinking about it now when I'm alone in my house at 10.30 at night? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, one of the things you were talking about, dim light, and that, I think that's what intrigues me about the Victorian era and the late 19th century. Yeah. You know, because I like to do the research with Jack the Ripper, but that image, it's just uh, those images, those pictures back then, that's just kind of so intriguing. Absolutely. Something about the long shadows, the way the flame light dances on the walls. It's so atmospheric and beautiful. Love it. <laughs> Michael's so into it, he still hasn't hooked up power in his house. <laughs> but don't, don't tell the wife I've been lying to her. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yes, we're having this conversation by carrier pigeon. Yeah. <laughs> what What is the premise of the story for listeners that don't know? Because we've been talking a lot about you and writing and stuff. So what What's the premise of the story? So the story follows Mina, a psychologist who lives in London. His OCD and has a very regimented and controlled life. And she is contacted by a childhood friend and asked for help. And her childhood friend is experiencing bizarre symptoms and begs her to come home to their small Welsh town, a place that Mina promised she would never return to. But of course she does. And when she arrives, she discovers that her friend has the same symptoms as one of her clients back in London. And she doesn't understand how these two women, 250 miles apart, are de demonstrating the same bizarre symptoms. And it kind of spirals from there. What happens to you when you finish a book like this? Like you put all this time into it and you live through your characters. How do you think this process changes you? Yeah, I do always feel that I'm different when I've come out of it. This one was interesting. It was more of a practical change. So when I started writing, I was a total panster. And I'd been teaching myself to plot for years and it was a trial by fire because I'd been to 15 schools and there were such gaps in my knowledge I had to teach myself a lot of things and plotting and language English language and the rules of language and the structure of language was one of them and when I did this project with Alloy they have a specific way of working where it's very plot heavy everything is plotted very carefully and then they did this thing where they we did a chapter by chapter outline together when we were plotting on the call. And I had never done that before. But by the end of it, I realized that I'd found a process that works so well for my brain. And so I've written two books since using the same system where I plot and I do chapter by chapter outlines. And I've discovered that I get the same thrill in the plotting that I used to get from the pansting, except it takes me about 20% no, more like 80% less time to do and complete the stories. So it was a very practical thing that I took away from this particular book. I'm grateful for it. The violence. How do you, how do you write the violence in your book, um, or do you avoid that? So I'm such a bad person to ask about this, because for me the madness is very light horror. It's very, this is not a dark book to me, but readers have told me that it's a very dark book for them. So I think that it's reaching a new audience who maybe are stepping foot into the horror genre. For me, the madness is, I mean, I don't think it's extremely violent or extremely dark. But maybe it's a matter of taste. You know, I feel like this book is more cozy. There's a lot of Welsh folklore. There's a lot of witchcraft in it. So for me, it feels more like a cozy horror. But other people have told me that it was very scary for them. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not the right person to ask. What did you think? Did you think it was a dark read? Did you think that it was violent? For me, no. God, you could uh, you could kill 50 people and bleed them out <laughs> and the whole thing, and, and I'm eating popcorn. In an original version, I had <laughs> Jonathan. In one of the versions, Jonathan becomes a vampire, and they have this naked, bloody fight, and she does chop his head off with a bread knife. I really loved that ending, but they were like, no, Dawn. You can't do this. So they constantly had <laughs> to rein me in. I actually do love how it turned out because people who don't read horror have written to me to say that they're now going to explore horror. And that to me is so wonderful because horror is just the best genre. There's a book for every taste. Step away <laughs> from the bread knife. <laughs> I don't want to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, step away. <laughs> And you do love butter, so... Yeah. <laughs> I love butter. Give me bread and butter every day. And a bread knife, of course. <laughs> the side of human blood. Yeah, well, there you go. Well, and, and the, so the bad, whenever you have bad characters or characters that are, you know, I don't want to say evil, but, you know, more or less on the dark side and stuff, do you, do you have any problem writing those characters or do you like writing those characters better than, let's say, ones that are more... Again, I don't want to say normal, but let's say more cheerful. I love a dark character. I love my villains. I would love to write novels from the villains' perspective. Actually, I have. Uh, I've had a book come out in March that is purely the <laughs> villains' perspective. Um, no, I love a good villain. I love the complexity of it. I love the idea that the villain thinks that they are right. You know, every villain thinks they're the hero of their own story, the cliche, but, you know, just the psychology of that. And also... What could you do to a human to push them to such extremes? 
oh, it's just fascinating to me. And also, how can you take two friends who are good people, cause so much pain between them that they're willing to destroy themselves, each other, and the world? That kind of psychology is so fascinating to me. Yeah, I just well, I love well, it. I, oh, you're into politics then, are you? <laughs> oh, strangely <laughs> enough, no. <laughs> I avoid it at all costs. In fiction, yes. In real yeah. world, no, not so much. Well, it's more about what, what the character believes the world is and what exactly. they believe they're in, right? So it's yeah. it's changing the setting or and uh, helping the reader understand what they see and why they think they need to do what they do. I think that makes that makes for a better, let's say, bad character or evil character, as they call it, like villain, it, it, because then you kind of understand why they do it you might not agree but you sort of totally understand it yes almost when the the protagonist and the villain are mirrors of each other where i love it where the protagonist is one step away from what the villain is oh beautiful i love the the heartbreak the tragedy of that kind of thing and you know the knowledge that the main character and the hero could have been the villain had one step in their history gone astray so the question on that, when, when we're looking at you know, Al and I, we're always dealing with these serial killers where they lack complete remorse, as in they're yeah. just, uh, they, they you know, would kill a fly or a human, it didn't matter to them. It's less, almost less evil, just that they do it. Yeah. But then uh, some of those movies where uh, the, the protagonist does lack remorse, he just does it, uh, he just likes to kill serial killers. <laughs> yeah, Dexter. Hello, yeah. Yes, right. I mean, I'm fascinated by psychopathy. I went through a phase where it was one of my hyperfixations because I'm so emotional and I really wish I wasn't. And so I, I just thought, okay, what would life be like if you just didn't feel all the things that people feel? And one thing they've come to understand about a low emotional threshold is that it's actually very difficult to make decisions when you have a low emotional threshold because you rely purely on logic, whereas... For somebody who's highly emotional like me, I make instant decisions and I, I do them very quickly, whereas my husband is autistic and he will labor over a decision for a long time and he's low emotion, low empathy. So that kind of thing fascinates me. Yeah, really. And, and it's like my son's uh, high-functioning autistic and mm. he takes everything uh, literally. Yes. Like, lots of yes. literalness. So uh, very interesting. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> what else is there? Sometimes, yeah, that's right. There's me speaking in my metaphors with my poetry, and my husband's like, okay, and? <laughs> and? <laughs> well, that's interesting. Now, you also, you're, you're into kind of like the witchcraft, vampire, paranormal sort of as well. Is yes. that something you, you've picked up naturally, or is that something you research for to, to, to kind of put into the book? Both. Um, I think my mother was very afraid of, you know, witchcraft and the paranormal growing up for personal reasons. And I was always fascinated with it, but it was always denied me. So uh, my Internet usage was checked so I couldn't like, research witchcraft. And any time I showed interest in anything like this, it was uh, heavily discouraged. So I've always had a fascination with the occult. Uh, whether or not I believe it is up for debate. But I, I think I like the aesthetic of it, the vibe of it. And when you're dealing with North Wales, it's hard to avoid, you know. Welsh folklore kind of permeates everything here. It's in the names of the towns. It's in the landscape. There is something very visceral about North Wales. It's so medieval here. So when I decided to try and make this book my own and really take ownership of it, and I decided to set it here, it was almost inevitable that it would be infused with Welsh folklore. And yeah, Mina's mother being a witch has <laughs> aided the story. The Batty Witch on the Hill. Um, I was called the, what did they call me one time? We moved to a village and the post lady, she called us, oh, that, that Batty couple up on the hill. <laughs> oh, that Batty <laughs> couple up on the hill. So I lifted that directly from my life. Um, yeah, I, I, obviously the source material is supernatural. It's gothic. It is, you know, so it was inevitable in that way too. It's so a bit of both. And then I had to do research and fact check things. And uh, don't ask me to pronounce any of it because I wouldn't dare uh, to no. try to get it wrong. <laughs> but uh, as far as I know, the woman who did the audiobook, Imogen Church, who is just amazing, um, she, I'm sure she's done a fabulous job. So if you want to hear how some of these uh, creatures and spells are pronounced, then maybe check out the audiobook. Yeah. 
Yeah. I do audio anyway. I'm getting so old I can hardly see. <laughs> <laughs> do you do that thing where you turn down the radio so that you can see better? Because I've started doing yeah, that. That's, that's, yeah. <laughs> That's, that's that's what I do. Yeah, it's terrible. I'm, I'm, turn, I'm turning into my my parents. You know, I'm it's just getting old. It's inevitable. Yeah. It's inevitable. Well, what an honor. You know, <laughs> it's a yeah, privilege to get old. I really didn't think I would get to, so I'm very happy. <laughs> yeah, glad I'm not all gray haired. What's wrong with that? <laughs> yeah, gray is the new black. You know? <laughs> I wouldn't. Yeah, know it's called silver out. fox, Al. It's silver fox, not gray. Okay, silver let me fox. ask you: What is the female equivalent of silver fox? I need to know. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, come on, Mike. The, that's a good the one. hag, the bog hag, because that's my aspiration. <laughs> I aspire to be the hag in the bog. <laughs> well, that's okay too, right? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. The village crazy. That's gonna be me. One day, the kids are gonna tell stories about that woman up in the forest. And it really will be the batty witch on the hill. Can't Don't go wait. near that place. <laughs> you know, people never return, you know. Yeah, that stuff. people go I to her for frog spawn. And <laughs> 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 they never come back. You'll Once upon a time, she, she wrote novels, but then she went crazy, and now she lives inside a cauldron. Oh, it's going to be fabulous. Yeah, I can see it. <laughs> well, where, where where do you see yourself going now? Like, what's what's going to happen here? Is is Dawn going to keep writing and going to keep into this uh, this world? Oh, absolutely! I'll, I'll keep writing. I've got um, another book out in March. At the moment, there's also another one next fall, and then another one the year after. So there's three more coming, and after that, yeah, I'll just keep writing as long as people want to read, and even if they don't, I should keep writing. <laughs> I almost can't help myself. <laughs> yeah. Therapeutic, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah, completely. You know, you kind of create a, a, a retro audience anyway, because, I mean, uh, you know, uh, I keep on the air even though nobody likes me. And <laughs> <laughs> How do you know? And you start getting a big pile of haters, but they still listen, so that's all that matters. <laughs> you know, haters are just secret admirers, especially if they're of listening. Of course. <laughs> of course, especially when they listen four or five times a week and they all write in. Four Absolutely. Or five times. Yeah. I mean, that's... <laughs> Thank you, know, you haters. It's, yeah, it's like insanity. <laughs> I don't understand it. Like, leave oh. me alone. I think maybe it's therapeutic for them to hate somebody. Maybe they don't yeah. like their job or whatever, and it sort of gets it out of them. Yeah. You should yeah, feel that's... honored to be the punchy yeah. guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the main thing is you create emotion, and that's that's yes, the game. Right? That's it. it. Yeah, doesn't matter which kind of emotion, but it might not be what you're looking for. But you could save a life. You never know. So suspense. So suspense writing. Do you like um, like what point of view do you write this from? Like who are we listening to when we read the book? You mean in terms of POV, or do you mean in terms of yeah point of view? Yeah. Well. Yeah. I mean, the madness is first person present, um, so it is Mina's point of view throughout the whole thing. Um, I I like first person present. There's an immediacy, and also you don't know if there's going to be a survivor the way you do if it's third person uh, in some cases. So uh, I think the the book that comes out next year is actually first person and second person. So I do sort of dip in and out of different styles. But this one, The Madness, is first person because I wanted it to feel intimate to Mina. Right. It create your suspense that way rather than... Yeah. I mean, I'm a serial diarist. So I love journaling. So possibly that's why it comes naturally to me. I just write down everything all the time. And so all of the side characters, the smaller characters in the book, where do you... Do you take them from people you've run into or you've seen somewhere or maybe at a coffee shop or a grocery store and you've sort of overheard someone or seen someone and do you, is that kind of a lot of times where you get some characters from yeah so i'm i'm definitely a magpie i'm always it's so funny my mother used to tell me off for people watching or she used to say don't stare at people cuz i used to just stare at people all the time <laughs> and now it's people watching and it's part of my job so i can do it but yeah i'm a yeah. magpie for pe- i i love people I don't, I'm not very social, I'm actually quite a hermit, but I love to watch people. I love collecting the way they move, the, 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 the turns of phrase that they use, the relationships people have with each other. And I, I'm a bit obsessive too, so I, I get it from film as well. So I obsessively watch film and I look at how they portray relationships and 
yeah, I'm, I'm quite, uh, it might even be linked to my OCD, I'm not sure. <laughs> but yeah, I collect everything I can. And then, I mean, I also have lists of lists. In my phone, I've got 900 and something lists, and all of them are mostly in use. And some of them are just names that I've enjoyed. Some of them are hand gestures that are interesting and in how I describe it. Some of them are scents. So I'm collecting things constantly. She's a strange one at the end of the road. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and do you have any any influences in in the writing or horror community itself? I do. Yes, so many, and it's so funny because I'm. It's rare that I read an entire body of work. I really should, but I'll read, you know, a novel by an author, and then decide that it's the greatest thing I've ever written, and I love them, and I should really read more of what they've done. Recently, I really enjoyed uh, Camilla Bruce's. You Let Me In. It's about a woman who, as an old woman, offers her surviving two relatives her fortune and her house. She's a novelist. If they read her unpublished manuscript that she has left in the house and identify the secret word, and the manuscript is the history of her life, and it gets so bonkers. It gets so bizarre. Beautiful. So, I, so her, she's one. Marcus Sedgwick was another one that was hugely influential for me. And in fact, I did read like three or four of his. Um, Mark Danielewski, of course. Um, Stephen King, like everyone. Those are the ones that have popped off the top of my head now. Stephen King, let me, I'm writing this down. Is, is he an author? <laughs> yeah, you might not have heard of him. It's kind of obscure. It's only yeah. for people in the know. <laughs> yeah, I can't seem to find him anywhere online. Know, so, so if you Google him, there's like two results. Yeah, the back, so he, in the back pages. Yeah, the dark to to some thrift <laughs> shop and find him somewhere or something, you know. Some I'm not some surprised. He's company. very, very <laughs> obscure. Yeah, yeah, well hidden. Which you know, I don't, I don't blame him. You know, anyway. <laughs> well, so, so here we go. Um, so let's talk about how you like fans to interact with you. Do you have like a website? Do you do social media with fans? All, all of that stuff. What's your connection? I do. I'm mostly on Instagram because I love the visual and you, you can create a sort of vibe. I love I love a good vibe. And Halloween's coming, so the vibe is going to be pumpkins and ghosts. So you yeah. should come and follow me there and we can talk. Uh, but yeah, I was on YouTube yeah. for a while, but uh, no longer. <laughs> Ain't nobody got time for that. No, uh, so I've got a website. I'm very rarely on Twitter slash X. Uh, but yeah, Instagram's a great way to get me. Uh, okay. Some sometimes Facebook, but I'm terrible at checking Facebook. So if anyone does want to say hi, and I hope you do, do come to Instagram. Oh, there you go, Instagram. You got to be why in TikTok if you like pictures. I do like TikTok, and I've got TikTok, but my phone screen has told me that I've spent nine hours on TikTok in the past. So TikTok is dangerous because <laughs> the algorithm is so good. And it keeps showing me Interview with the Vampire videos, and I just end up watching them all day instead of eating, sleeping, or doing anything else. Okay. It's research. <laughs> I call yeah. it research. There you go. There you go. For research. writing. See? Yeah. Everything well, is valid. What That's was that perfect. quote from Shirley Jackson? Nothing is wasted. <laughs> That's what TikTok says. <laughs> just like your people watching. There's Absolutely. a reason. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Staring that at is, people someone's do it. with my mouth hanging open is research. And any coffee that lady's staring at us. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Tax deductible coffee for people watching. <laughs> yeah. Who's that strange lady? Well, anyway, the book is called The Madness, a novel. Well, so we really appreciate coming on. And, Thank you so uh, much. Glad for you did. And it was Dawn, great speaking with you. Dawn it's Kurtigan. going to be so good to talk to you guys again. You need to come to North Wales. I'll take you out for some bar brief. We have a friend there, uh, Paul Begg. Al's interviewed him, so he's ah. from Wales as well. He's a, he's a Jack the Ripper guy. He's one of the top experts. Oh, nice. So there's a reason why I'm going to go there. Okay, so. if the second you land, message me. We'll hang out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> With my cauldron and my slugs and my frog spawn. Yeah, That's you. right. Just click your heels three times. And <laughs> during no, Halloween. No, no, no. Halloween. I'm the green one. <laughs> 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 Thanks so much for having me, guys. Thank you.
This has been a production of the House of Mystery Radio Show. To find out more about our show, guests, or hosts, go to our website at houseofmysteryradio.com.